Good morning. This is the um, American Academy of Ophthalmology Anterior Segment Imaging Symposium. Um, I'm Sanjay Patel from Mayo Clinic. Uh, Vishal Janji should have been co-moderating but was unable to make it to the meeting. Uh, so Shizuka Ko sitting next to me will be my co-moderator. Okay, thank you. So this, uh, this topic is, uh, is Scheinflug imaging of uh, Fuchs endothelial corneal dystrophy, which is a condition we see a lot of at, at Mayo Clinic and uh, do a lot of research on. So I have no disclosures. So these are, these are Scheinflug images. They look like slit lamp images. Um, and the question is, which of these corneas have Fuchs dystrophy? So uh, you can take your pick yourself, uh, but I'm going to tell you that um, you cannot make a diagnosis of Fuchs dystrophy just looking at Scheinflug images. Um, so it's a trick question. This is a better question. All of these corneas have Fuchs dystrophy. Which, which ones have clinically important disease? And I think it should be obvious that these two over here have thick corneas, and you can see corneal edema present in the slit beam. But I'm going to tell you that this cornea that's thin, thinner than average, and this cornea that's thicker than average, neither of them look like they have corneal edema, but both of them do. And you have to do tomographic analyses of these corneas to understand that, and that's what I'm going to show you. The answer is all in the back surface of the cornea. In Scheinflug imaging, which uh, is otherwise known as the pentacam, uh, Scheinflug imaging allows you to uh, map the elevation of the back surface of the cornea, and that's the surface that changes first in Fuchs dystrophy. When you measure the uh, power of the back surface of the cornea, it changes in moderate and advanced Fuchs dystrophy, and when you measure the toricity or the astigmatism on the back surface, that also changes, okay? And that's actually important because you should not be placing toric lenses in these eyes. This is, um, these are the tomographic maps that you get from the Scheinflug uh, imaging device. And this is of a normal cornea. And this here is the corneal thickness map, which is derived from the elevation maps of the anterior and posterior surfaces. And this is a normal corneal thickness map, which has uh, circular, almost circular, or very slightly oval isopacks. Isopacks are lines that join points of equal thickness. And these isopacks are pretty concentric and parallel to each other. This round, small circle here is the thinnest point of the cornea, which should be central or very slightly infratemporal. Then this map over here is the posterior elevation map. Uh, and this is quite homogeneous in this, in this normal eye. Uh, there's no obvious um, abnormality. This is a cornea, though, with Fuchs dystrophy. And what's changed here is that the isopacks, the lines joining points of equal thickness, are now very irregular. 
Okay, they're no longer circular or concentric. The thinnest point of the cornea is now displaced nasally. That's, that's abnormal. And it's displaced nasally because the posterior surface of the cornea is now displaced towards the anterior chamber. It's bulging towards the anterior chamber. And that's because there's an area of corneal edema right here. And the tomography system here can detect this corneal edema before you see it at the slit lamp. So these are the loss of parallel isopax, displacement of the thinnest point of the cornea, and then focal depression. Those are the three factors that we now look at tomographically in these patients. So here's case number one. This patient is 56-year-old with blurred vision, has been told she has amblyopia, has minimal cataract, and she has very abnormal corneal thickness maps, posterior depression. Uh, she has corneal gouttae, best corrected vision of 2060. It's a thin cornea. But I did a DMAC surgery with cataract surgery, and now she sees 2020, and her cornea is very thin, okay? Thinner than average, but she sees well. The second patient, same kind of thing, minimal cataract, Hoop's dystrophy, has subtle irregularity of these corneal thickness and posterior elevation maps. Corneal thickness, slightly thicker than average. This patient also had a DMEC with cataract surgery. Now the maps are more normal, um, and the cornea is thinner. And then this patient actually has a thicker cornea, thicker than average. The vision is 2030, has more cataract, has Fuchs dystrophy, but these maps are normal. If anything, there's posterior elevation, not depression. I did do a DMAC on this patient, and I got very marginal improvement. Vision is now 2020, but the maps didn't change very much. There's a slight improvement in corneal thickness, but not by a lot. So for the other eye of this patient, which had pretty much the same types of corneal maps, I just did cataract surgery, and this patient sees 2020 four years later with minimal change in corneal thickness. So what does this mean? It means that we've, we are now classifying Fuchs dystrophy differently. Um, we use tomography to do this, and it's simple. It's either Fuchs dystrophy with clinically definite edema, which means you see the edema at the slit lamp. If you do not see edema, it's, it might be Fuchs with subclinical edema, and you detect that using tomography, looking for those patterns I showed you. And then there's a group of Fuchs that has no tomographic edema. And this is all independent of central corneal thickness. We don't look at the absolute thickness anymore. We look at the thickness map pattern. We followed this up and we applied this classification to a group of 96 eyes. And these patients were followed for a median of five years. And they have a range of severity of Fuchs dystrophy. And you can see this group here, this group six, all has corneal edema and their uh, tomography maps are abnormal. But there's also abnormalities in these milder grades of Fuchs dystrophy as well. This is, this is what's important, is when you look at those three parameters, each of them independently uh, predicts progression of the disease over a five-year period. When you look at central corneal thickness, this is not predictive. Okay, so the tomography maps are much more highly predictive than just measuring central thickness. You have to actually do a multivariable analysis to look at these factors, and when you do that, these are the two that jump out as, as independently significant. Again, it's loss of isopax, regular isopax, displacement of the thinnest point. Central corneal thickness is statistically significant, but clinically this, this value here, the hazard ratio, is very low. So clinically it's of very low importance. This is actually important. We're often faced with do we remove the cataract in Fuchs dystrophy or do we remove the cataract and do endothelial keratoplasty? And often that's been a subjective judgment call. Well, now we have some objective evidence to say, look at the tomography. If you have three abnormal features, there's a 90% chance that that cornea will progress in the next five years. If you have none of the features present, there's only a 7% risk of progression. And this is in the setting of cataract surgery. It's almost the same. If none of those features are present, they have a low risk of progressing. And it was, it's fair to take the cataract out without doing endothelial keratoplasty. 
So this is, these are old classifications of this disease. This, this was great when we did penetrating keratoplasty. We don't do that anymore. Uh, so this classification is no longer valid. We still grade GUTE from a research perspective using this morphology, but it's subjective. There's not good agreement, and it doesn't really ta talk about subtle or subclinical corneal edema. And endothelial imaging using specular microscopy does not help in this disease for a variety of reasons. And central corneal thickness by itself is not helpful. It's a change in thickness that is more helpful. And the textbooks need to be revised and rewritten as well, uh, as these can often be misleading. This is what we recommend now. It's the pachymetric uh, tomographic uh, analysis using shine plug imaging. And the bottom line is, if you see corneal edema, you know that patient needs treatment. But when you don't see corneal edema, get tomography and look for it because it might be there, and if it's there, it's telling you their risk of progression or their risk of progression after cataract surgery. So it's a revised classification. It's easy to do if you have the imaging available to you. Um, it predicts the prognosis. We've also shown it's very repeatable, um, and it's going to be very important as we move towards clinical trials for this condition. So I'd like to thank you for your time. So what do you suggest, uh, do we simply depend on the shim plug image or we combine it with the specular microscopy to take the decision? Um, I don't do specular microscopy for these eyes because the GUTE, you know, there's regional variation as to whether you're going to see cells um, and, and um, you'll, therefore you'll have sampling errors. So, you know, the image I showed you, specular microscopy, it depending on how, where you measure and how you measure, you're going to get multiple different answers. It, it doesn't help me at all. Okay. Thank you so much for a very uh, uh, interesting talk. Can we uh, get the similar kind of information from the OptoView? Because we have more OptoView in, uh, installations here. Yeah, that, I think that's a good question. I mean, the theoretically, this should be able to be done by, by OCT. Um, I'm not aware if, if, if does the OptiView allow you to generate a thickness map? And yes, it, it does. It does. It, it has a corneal map, too. Then, then theoretically, it should, yeah. We, we don't have the OptiView. We don't use it. But theoretically, it should give you the same patterns. And it's, it's to be investigated. Second question. Uh, any, uh, we don't have so many good uh, corneal transplant centers in India, but the, the number of people are very large. Is there a role for repasidol in these kind of patients? We have uh, Indian uh, generic equivalents in the market now. Um, again, it needs a ra randomized trial to, to, to show that. Um, certainly there's, there's people you know, doing this off-label in different countries. Um, I think it's an exciting area, but we need, we need methods to measure the impact of something like repositol, and uh, tomography may actually give you some parameters that you can objectively measure to see if it's having an effect or not, but time will tell us here. Um, sometimes when, when there is severe edema or especially epithelial edema, the tomography maps are not going to be reliable, but you already have a clinical diagnosis in that situation. So, so such patients are not included for the uh, analysis? Correct, yeah. These were all patients that clinically had no edema, but, but with tomography did have edema. Uh, 
thank you for the invi invitation. <coughs> Donc, <coughs> hello. Donc, anterior segment OCT, uh, especially in infectious uh, keratitis. So, main issues are, um, are uh, many, are in the management of uh, infectious uh, keratitis. We have uh, some issue. We should do an early etiological uh, diagnosis. We should monitor, we monitor uh, our patient to detect uh, early improvement or uh, worsening in order to adjust uh, the treatment. How can uh, OCT help us uh, improve the management of uh, infectious uh, keratitis? In real life, we do the clinical examination with a plain uh, slit lamp, sometimes uh, with a photo. So the photo slip lens is uh, very useful because uh, we can uh, follow our patients uh, with uh, many doctors. We can uh, detect uh, clinical uh, changes at an early stage, but the limit uh, is uh, two dimension. So spectral domain anterior segment OCT appears to be a non-invasive uh, tool and uh, it can very be can uh, very be, it, yeah, it can uh, be useful for uh, for our patients. So in our hospital, we use uh, the OptoView uh, XR Aventi. We have a nice field of view, eight millimeters. The T the T is uh, 250 micrometer, a good uh, quite good resolution, eight micrometer. It's, it permits uh, 3D uh, OCT pachymetry. So we are used to do uh, some uh, images, some, some cross-sectional uh, images, one uh, horizontal cornea centered light, one vertical, one raster cornea, and one pachymetry. And for small lesions, we do one horizontal uh, line and one vertical line on the, on the lesion. So, so uh, Soliman uh, presented uh, a correlation between uh, what we observe in uh, our clinical practice and what we observe in uh, OCT. So we can say that uh, a stromal infiltrate is an hyperreflective uh, lesion what is uh, also important is uh, how to detect the, ne the necrosis with uh, small uh, cystic spaces in the lesion. So they detect, uh, we can see uh, also here, the, the small uh, cystic uh, spaces. What is uh, also important is uh, general parameters, the central corneal thickness, the corneal thickness at the level of the infiltrate, the infiltrate width, the infiltrate uh, thickness. Donc, in our hospital, we found it very interesting to etiological uh, diagnosis. For example, here we, we see white plague sometimes with us with uh, just uh, an image at the sleep plant we cannot uh, see the the white plague so it's very useful because with this white pl white plague we so we can uh, think about uh, fungal keratitis without the OCT we we would have uh, more uh, effort uh, we have more efforts. For this uh, patient, uh, we have a plain uh, keratitis under uh, contact lens. We can say, oh, it's uh, just uh, the toxicity of uh, the product. Uh, but with uh, OCT, we can uh, see also uh, keratoneuritis and uh, that is also uh, useful 
and we have the diagnosis of uh, Acanth amoeba. We have also uh, keratoneuritis in uh, viral uh, keratitis, but here the context uh, helps us. Here it's uh, another uh, patient with a large uh, defect, uh, with a large ep uh, epithelial uh, defect. We do the OCT, and uh, in the, with the OCT, we can see uh, a big uh, edema, so we can uh, also uh, think about uh, acantamoeba keratitis. It's very useful in uh, post-LASIC to, to analyze the infiltrate. Here, the infiltrate extends before the, before the interface, and uh, after the interface, so it's, um, it seems to, to be uh, an, an infectious keratitis. After, uh, after the scraps, uh, it was a streptococcus pneumonia. For uh, another case, we saw post-LASIC. 15 days later, we saw an infiltrate with an extension in the stroma and in the end uh, to the epithelium. Keratic, keratic precipitate, sometimes it's very difficult uh, to, to see them at the sleep time when uh, there's a big uh, edema. So here we can uh, see a keratic precipitate and we can uh, evoke the viral uh, etiology. Interest in assessing severity is uh, also uh, a particularity for the OCT. Perhaps not for this case, but when we do uh, an OCT, we can uh, see the cystic spaces and is a uh, very bad uh, prognosis. Fungal keratitis. If, if we saw uh, some uh, white plaque behind uh, the lesion, it's uh, also uh, not a good uh, prognosis. Interest in follow-up to stop the treatment. So it's a fungal keratitis. 10 days later, the, the infiltrate uh, is uh, very clear, but at the OCT, we have uh, still an hyperreflective uh, lesion, so we cannot uh, stop uh, so quickly uh, the treatment. So in summary, we can say that the OCT is very useful for uh, fungus and acantamoeba uh, keratitis. Limits uh, are many artifacts uh, for severe lesions with the shadow cone, no eye tracker, so it's not very uh, rob reproducible. No direct measurement of the infiltrate uh, in the 3D mode. Advantages are, are also here <laughs> with uh, an objective tool in the monitoring uh, infectious uh, keratitis. It's non-invasive. So OCT appears to be a complementary tool uh, for the management of infectious keratitis in uh, acantamoeba, in uh, fungus. In future, we expect uh, also an higher resolution, an eye tracker, as in uh, retina uh, OCT, perhaps uh, coupled to the sleep plant, and uh, after that, an analysis uh, of the lesion with uh, uh, software. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very nice talk. The primary problem I face with my bacterial infection is to know when I can taper the fortified antibiotics because toxicity is a problem. Is there, and we depend only on clinical signs. Is there any hard sign we can get from doing an anti-segment OCT where we can taper the antibiotics faster? Uh, perhaps with the diminution of the cystic spaces, but for bacterial, it's 
also the, the same dimensions of the infiltrate at the simple at the simple uh, ah, at the slit lump the dimension uh, in OCT are the same so for just to monitor the infiltrate for bacterial keratitis it's not a good tool it's it's useful to quantify the edema uh, to see a uh, white plaque behind the endothelium to see uh, to see some um, cystic spaces but just to analyze the infiltrate and the dimension the OCT is not good um. OCT is used for assessing the radial keratoneuritis. Uh, mm. So how much time it takes for this lesion to get disappeared in the follow-up anti-segment OCT so that you can taper the steroids if yes. anything is being initiated? Mm. Well, for the viral keratitis, is very important because uh, we treat um, so, uh, with the, the criteria of treatment are the edema, the keratitis, Keratic uh, precipitates, and that is uh, useful, but uh, for bacterial, not very. Uh, yes, for uh, acondameba keratitis and uh, fungal uh, keratitis. Thank you. Ju Juliette, do you uh, image everybody that has a corneal infection or do you select select the patients that you image? Or? We, uh, the first uh, day uh, at the entrance, we image all the patients and uh, then it depends on the microbiological results. If it's a bacteria, at the end of the hospitalization, we do another uh, OCT. But for fungal keratitis or uh, acantameba keratitis or viral keratitis, every two days, we do uh, an OCT. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. So I'll be talking to you about intraoperative OCT guided corneal surgeries and intraoperative OCT is a very uh, expensive tool to have but uh, but it is very useful if you have it your surgeries become uh, your surgeries are uh, fine tuned completely by the intraop OCT microscope not that you can't do it you can still do it And uh, unfortunately, I don't have any financial or proprietary interests, although we have seven of these now at our center. So it is a non-invasive uh, uh, diagnostic tool which renders an in vivo cross-sectional view of the optical tissue. And it gives you real-time images with dynamic visualization, both planar and cross-sectional views of the surgical field are available 
to the surgeon through the same eyepiece and it allows continuous and simultaneous acquisition and display of the OCT images. Of course, it is expensive and the availability may be an issue at all centers. Now, uh, this is just to uh, show uh, various uh, surgeries in which it can be used. Now, if you have a Desmet's membrane detachment such as here, which is a very large one, and you put the air bubble or inject the air bubble inside, then uh, you can see that the uh, Desmet's membrane, the detachment is still there, but it, it is shallow. And if I didn't have this IOCT, I would probably think that I'm done, but actually I'm not done. But another important indicator is that as you put this air bubble, it becomes clearer on the table itself. And you take out the needle, uh, and again you see that there will be a shallow uh, Desmet's membrane detachment. So important thing is when you take out this needle, you put a little bit of pressure or alternatively put a blob of helon over there or uh, hyaluron, uh, uh, any high viscosity uh, OVD over there so that the bubble or the air doesn't egress out. Now, uh, again, it is important to know in a case like this, which was referred to us for, in fact, corneal transplantation, where your Desmet's membrane detachment is. So if it has scrolled edges like this, and if you go through this area, you will increase the scroll. But if you go through the green arrow, you would cause the attachment of the Desmet's membrane to the overlying stroma, and you will have a clear cornea. Now, uh, when you do a big bubble DALC, there can be essentially two types of bubbles. One is the type one big bubble, which is above uh, Dua's layer, and uh, uh, you, you obtain a rough surface such as this when a type a one big bubble is formed. Or if the bubble is injected below Dua's layer, then you have a smooth surface such as this because it has gone beyond the Dua's layer. Now, this is just to show a type one big bubble DALC. So, uh, to get a 60 to 70 percent has been done. And this is a type one big bubble but is because it is going from the center to the periphery. It is at the keratectomy site and not beyond it. And then uh, this is an inverted image, but you can see that the Desmet's membrane has fallen quite back. And uh, as the nick is given in the overlying stromal layers, just notice in a live show, the Desmet's membrane is marching towards the overlying stromal layers as the air is aggressing out. So this is there in the surgeon's whole view in the surgical uh, view for the surgeon, and uh, the surgeon can actually see both of them uh, simultaneously. And then uh, one uh, puts viscoelastic agent in the supradesmet's membrane com compartment, and this inflates like a kangaroo's pouch at the back. And then the overlying stromal layers can then be excised with the help of the uh, scissors uh, so that the bare desmet's membrane uh, uh, looks at you, and then you know that there's no perforation and then you, your dissection is perfect and then a full thickness donor cornea is then placed with tensor monofilament nylon sutures which, uh, uh, with, which are interrupted. Now sometimes you can have a type 2 big bubble. Notice that this type 2 big bubble starts from the periphery towards the center and it is coming up till here and I've, st I've uh, stopped it here because I don't want it to go uh, towards this side because then if you do a uh, a paracentesis, then there is every chance that you may perforate a Desmet's membrane. So after doing this paracentesis, notice that the uh, air bubble, uh, uh, a the configuration of this air bubble will change because actually there are uh, two bubbles here, type one and type two. And then as you give a nick in the overlying stromal layers, this bubble which is there will move extremely fast as opposed to a very slow movement of the bubble with, with the type one uh, when you uh, cause the aggression. And again, like similarly in the previous case, one can put the viscoelastic, the Desmet's membrane Dua's layer complex drops down and then the dissection can be done. Now this was again a case in which there was a type one and a type two bubble both. And it was a case of uh, healed keratitis. So uh, the trifidation was done and the big bubble is being formed. So this is a type one bubble which is being formed because it is going from the center to the periphery and it is at the keratectomy site, this is the type 1 bubble. And look here, there is another type 2 bubble uh, which is there, which one can see uh, uh, very faintly. Uh, very faintly, you can see that there is a type 2 bubble also which is present. Now again, uh, the, uh, as is customarily done, the uh, stromal layer uh, debulking is done first. And after uh, doing the stromal layer uh, debulking, the nick is given in the overlying stromal layers. And of course, when the nick is given in the overlying stromal layers, one of the bubble will come out. So as you give a nick in the overlying stromal layers, uh, these are just to show static pictures. The Desmet's membrane is here. And just as the air aggresses out, it keeps marching upwards like I showed in the previous case. 
So the, the pre-dua space goes on decreasing and now uh, dua layer is opposed to the uh, residual part of the stroma. Now again, uh, viscoelastic is instilled and uh, uh, you can again see that du the, the, the Desmet's membrane will move at the back. Of course, the overlying uh, stromal layers are then again split and uh, after splitting, uh, this is again the bare, uh, uh, bare dua's layer Desmet's membrane complex that you can see. And uh, again, as you give a nick in the overlying stromal layers, uh, notice that there's another bubble now which has moved from the periphery towards the center. So this is a nick which is given superiorly. And uh, another nick is given now. The challenge is to take this bubble out, which is the second bubble. And then when it decreases in size, then one can slowly cajole it out. And again, you can notice that when it collapses, you can actually see here on the intraop OCT microscope that it's collapsed and a full thickness donor cornea is then placed. Again, sutured with 10 -zero monofilament nylon sutures. So uh, it also helps in other surgeries like uh, SLET, especially the chemical injury cases, because these uh, corneas tend to be thinner. But here, you know that there is uh, normal thickness cornea that is there. Otherwise, you can have a lot of surprises when you remove the panis. And then uh, the limbal lenticule, which has been uh, taken from the uh, fellow eye, is cut into small, small pieces, is placed circumferentially all around. And you can see this on the IOCT itself. And this is uh, followed by the amniotic membrane, which is then placed over it and is then glued. Now, this is just to show uh, when you do a slit in, in, a, in a case where panis was present, without having to do a corneal transplant, you know, you can have a, a six by nine vision with a clear cornea. Now, it also helps in cases of desmetoceles. Uh, this was a case of meningitis with the desmets membrane. And uh, uh, this is a small piece of, uh, 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 small piece of tissue which has been put and the patient could not, be under, could not be taken under general anesthesia because of meningitis and block also could not be given because of a large uh, desmetoceles. So what is done is a sutureless uh, patch graft. And when you do that and the graft is so huge, you can actually see whether the apposition is uh, occurring completely or not. And uh, uh, it's not opposed completely, so you have to keep pushing it back. And the end point is when it, it is completely opposed as of now, and then you know that you can leave it after ap applying a bandage contact lens. And this is the post-op picture of the same. Now, uh, it is also very useful in cases of uh, DSEC uh, when uh, your corneas are hazy, such as in this case. So uh, this is the bucin glide over which the uh, DSEC lenticule has been loaded. And uh, we tend to do, in fact, cases of DSEC in hazy corneas. And when you can't make out where the graft is, you know on your intraop OCT microscope where the graft is. And then air bubble is uh, instilled, and uh, you know whether the graft is stuck to the back of the cornea. And you can see there's a sl slight amount of detachment here. But if I didn't have this IOCT microscope, I would again think probably it's pretty attached. And as you hydrate the wounds, again, notice how the graft moves a little bit with each hydration of the wound. But the end point, of course, has to be the graft is completely opposed to the back of the cornea. Then sometimes you have very thin uh, uh, grafts, especially when you're doing an ultra-thin DSEC, and it's got inverted. Now, uh, you have to look for this orientation and flip it over so that now when this ultra-thin DSEC uh, uh, conforms to the curvature of the cornea, you know that endothelial side is down. And again, this is a challenge in hazy corneas, uh, which are a reality uh, in our part of the world. Now, uh, again, in cases of DMAC, it is very useful, especially if you're not using a S-shaped stamp. So after doing desmetorexes, you can actually see if there are any desmet membrane remnants or not. And if they are there, then these desmet membrane remnants can be addressed looking at the intraoperative OCT microscope. And then subsequently, the graft is taken in the goiter uh, uh, cannula uh, and is then uh, injected intracamerally and uh, is centralized. Now, this is a graft which is completely folded, and the orientation of this graft, uh, you don't know whether. Now, this is an upside down graft, because your, uh, the configuration in the intraop OCT microscope tells you. And then you have to flip it and get it to like a biceps curl upwards. And this is, you know, in the correct orientation. And when it's in the correct orientation, it is spread. And then air bubble is injected. And now it is quite stuck to the back of the cornea. And this is the same case that I showed you post-op uh, picture at month one. You can hardly make out that there's ever a graft that is present. Then again, in cases of PDEC, it is useful when you're forming the big bubble uh, 
uh, for the desmet membrane uh, dual layer separation and when you do a PDEC, then uh, uh, you can see the bubble uh, which is formed there. This is then stained with the help of the uh, tripan blue again and uh, with the help of the Varna scissors, the PDEC graft is uh, uh, fashioned. Uh, again, it's a little crude procedure because you're touching the edges of the graft to cut that graft. Uh, but after uh, this is uh, formed, this is placed in the petri dish with the saline. And this is a case where PDEC again has been attempted. And when you have hypotrophic epithelium such as this, these can be again seen very well on the intraop OCT microscope. Then when you are doing the desmetorexis or removing the membranes, this again can be seen on the intraop OCT microscope. You can see that the desmetorexis is being done. And if there are any remnants, then these can also be addressed. And uh, uh, of course, then you have this PDEC graft in a goiter's cannula. And this is then injected just like for all endothelial keratoplasties. And then this graft behaves differently. So it moves over a bubble, unlike a DMEC graft, which will never move over an air bubble. Uh, and uh, after installing the air bubble, the, uh, DMEC, uh, the PDEC graft is then uh, spread all around. And then you know that it is stuck to the back of the cornea when you look at the intraop OCT microscope. Now, uh, it is also useful in healed hydrops cases because you can, uh, you can see that there is a scarring which is present anteriorly and there is a scarring which is present also posteriorly because of the healed hydrops. So when you are doing a layer by layer dissection, you can actually dissect above the uh, scar and leave a little bit of stroma there. So uh, uh, this is the uh, layer by layer dissection which is being done. And as you come to the area of the scar, which can be seen very well on the intraop OCT microscope, you can go a little anteriorly so that you bypass the area of the scar completely. Sometimes you can even dissect through these scars, but that's a little dangerous. So you can see that there's some amount of stroma there at the, at the point where the healed hydrops is, and this much can be left, especially if it is in the paracentral area. And your visual access is quite clear, but if you do a uh, AS OCT, you realize that 52 microns of the stroma in the desmets membrane is there, but in terms of visual acuity, it doesn't make too much of a difference. Then I think uh, this uh, we've again described and published. Sometimes what happens is when you are doing a, a, a smile procedure, a little bit of remnant of the uh, lenticule may be left behind. So those can also be rescued with the help of the intraop OCT microscope. This happened in one of our cases, and it was so edematous uh, and hazy uh, that you could not make out where the uh, lenticule was. So this idea came to us, and we immediately shifted the patient on that uh, uh, very moment to the uh, OR, which had intraop OCT microscope. And then you can actually see uh, where the remnant is or where uh, the uh, lenticule is. If you've done too much of excessive needling, then also it becomes an issue to uh, retrieve this uh, lenticule. So you can actually see uh, by the area of the hyper-reflectivity where your lenticule is, and uh, one can then dissect and can uh, uh, remove this lenticule uh, uh, completely. So this can be used even to do a normal uh, uh, smile procedure, especially in the in the learning curve or else even to rescue the lenticule so that you don't have to plan the surgery at, at, at a next uh, visit. So to conclude, intraoperative OCT is a useful tool in the armamentarium of anterior segment surgeons. It helps to see the third dimensions in vivo. And of course, modifications and quantifications are required in the current system for accuracy. Sometimes in the previous generations didn't have uh, a scale to it, so we standardized our own scale to know at what level we are dissecting because you have to keep comparing it with the adjacent tissue to know, especially in cases of anterior lamellar keratoplasty, what is the level of dissection. But the newer generations do have a scale attached so you know at what level dissection is being done. So thank you for your uh, kind attention. Uh, it has two uh, instruments, so it's anterior segment OCT and operating microscope. And now the current model has a callisto also with it. So you can do your torix also with a sutureless procedure because you can see the you can see the mark of the toric as well as the centration of the lens as well as the capsular axis. So that's pretty expensive. It is almost uh, three plus crores.
Thank you. I think I'm using for all surgeries. I can't seem to do cataract also without a drop OCT microscope. It's like that. We have seven of them now in our center. Even Tushar uses intraop OCT. We all work on intraop OCT microscopes only. I think uh, all of us in our unit are working on that. Okay. Yeah, so it's a bit of indulgence. <laughs> No, I'm sure the companies in India would come out with their indigenous counterparts, which not which will not be that expensive. And like with every other technique and technology, uh, for that matter, like femto, whether it was femto, or it was femto lasik, or it was femto cataract, or it, it is this intraop OCT. So they change, you know, with every uh, with the every uh, newer thing that comes, one has to change and one adapts to it and adopts it, and the prices also come down. It's only, you know, now that the prices are a little higher. No, Namrata, for um, DMEX surgery, do you put an S stamp on at all, or you just rely on the OCT? Uh, see, the first case that I did for DMEX, we had an intraop OCT microscope, and I did it without putting an S tag. Like, in fact, that the case that I showed you was the first DMEX that I was doing. But uh, having said that, uh, in hazy corneas, I think intraop OCT is a great tool because sometimes in hazy corneas, you can't even see the S tag, yeah. the ones that we get. And then intraop OCT comes to your rescue. But then, having said that, if you have a good S tag and if you have a relatively clear cornea, I think uh, that's the way to go. And now we put, that's how we all have been taught, we put S tag and use an intraop OCT microscope both. Any other questions? Great. Thank, thank you for finding time for us. <laughs> so our next speaker uh, will be uh, Dr. Shizuka Ko from Osaka University. And uh, she's going to tell us what is new in dry eye imaging. Good morning, everybody. Okay, I'm my, my name is Shizuka Ko from Osaka University, Japan. It is my great honor to be invited here to give a talk today. My talk to the, today is dry imaging, uh, what is new? Uh, visual complaints are uh, common among the dry patients in our clinical practice, as you know. Common visual uh, complaints include uh, fluctuating vision with the blink, Glare, 
blur vision and eye fatigue. But however, uh, since these subjective symptoms are generally common in your patient who visit eye clinics, unfortunately, some dry eye cases may be diagnosed as an identified trouble from complaints. The tear film and ocular surface is very important uh, optical element of the eye. The tear film is uh, actually seen. The tear film is the first refracting surface of the eye. It is actually plays a very important role. In healthy eye, uh, smooth, uh, clear, clear optical surface is formed by every single ring. However, once the tear film actually breaks up and exposes the rough surface of the cornea, it actually results in irregular optical surface leading to the uh, visual, uh, um, uh, uh, okay, uh, irregular actually visual function. So there is another reason why actually uh, uh, dry patients actually are uh, undiagnosed because if, although visual complaints are very common among the drier patients, standard visual acuity tests cannot detect the visual disturbance in drier because most of the drier patients have good visual quality, uh, at least detect, uh, measured with standard visual acuity. But recently, as you know, there's a, a number of uh, numerous advances in corneal topography and waveform sensing. Actually, it can help us to actually to measure actually op optical quality objectively, and also it uh, enables us to measure uh, actually uh, to measure the optical quality measurement continuously, better to understand how the ocular surface in dry eye uh, dry eye actually influences quality of vision. So in my talk, what I'd like to actually share with you, uh, based on our previous study, what is known and what advances have been made in evaluating and understanding quality of vision in dry eye. You may have such experience. So this is the placido-based topographer maps. So since the placido topographer uh, uses the uh, reflection of Maya ring images projected into the air tear film interface, Dry eye, uh, in dry eye, you may have some th you may actually observe such kind of tear film induced uh, topographic changes. This is uh, actually uh, the one female patient. She was actually referred as keratoconus suspect. You may you may actually suspect actually uh, keratoconus, but the other actually uh, tomographic or other uh, other assessment actually uh, was actually. Uh, diagnosed that uh, she, she is not a kila, real keratoconus. Actually, you can see the corneal epithelial damage in the lower part of the cornea. It may actually uh, cause some kind of keratoconus-like topographic changes in dry eye. Shown here is uh, uh, actually our previous study. Actually, we use uh, a Fourier analysis actually to uh, analyze uh, corneal irregular astigmatism in dry eye. So Fourier analysis can separately quantify the refractive components of the cornea. So red, uh, red uh, box is the original uh, topographic map. Then it can actually, uh, it, it is actually decomposed into spherical regular stigmatism, asymmetric component, and higher order irregularity. Blue boxes actually, are actually include asymmetric components and higher order irregular component. These are actually regarded as irregular astigmatism. If you look at the uh, irregular astigmatism in normal eye and dry eye, you can see the color changes in dry eye. So, so Fourier analysis actually can actually uh, detect the uh, corneal irregular astigmatism in dry eye quantitatively. We investigate the association between the uh, corneal epithelial damage and corneal irregular astigmatism in dry eye. We actually uh, graded the uh, corneal epithelial damage based on the NOI, NOI, NOEI scale, and actually and grade zero and grade one and grade two or three. So what we found is actually the comp asymmetric, sorry, as asymmetric components and higher order irregularity components actually are correlated with the severity of corneal epithelial damage. 
Now uh, I can I'd like to sh uh, show you the uh, continuous corneal topographic measurement. There is a device which can measure the uh, topographic uh, corneal maps uh, continuously. The left side is the uh, uh, sequential topographic maps in normal. You can see the uh, almost normal uh, topographic maps. But in dry eye, if we actually measure the uh, continuous topographic me measurement uh, every second, you can see the uh, kind of uh, changes uh, with time in dry eye. Actually, uh, previously, uh, we actually measured the uh, higher observation before and after tear film breakup to investigate the tear film breakup, uh, effect of tear film breakup actually on higher observations. As you know, <coughs> sorry, higher observation cannot be detected by visual uh, acuity test, and higher observation cannot be uh, corrected by glasses. So this is these images are actually uh, obtained by in, in normal eye. Before the uh, before the tear film breakup, you can see the irregular uh, wavefront spot pattern. But after the tear film breakup, you can see the distorted uh, spot pattern here. And also, uh, if you compare the uh, higher order vibrations, uh, significantly we observe the uh, increase of higher order vibration after the tear film breakup. So tear film breakup actually affects uh, uh, higher order vibrations. So we actually uh, developed the, uh, previously we developed the, uh, the machine to device uh, to measure the wavefront vibration continuously. These are the images from normal eye and dry eye with Sjogren's syndrome. So, so we measure the uh, wavefront vibration every second uh, and, uh, for 10 seconds, for 10 seconds. So if you look at the normal eye, you can see the stable uh, wavefront vibration map and also the simulated retinal images are almost stable. But you, if you look at the dry eye, Dry eye, you can see the uh, kind of many uh, red and blue colors uh, from the beginning, uh, right after the blink, and and also simulated retinal image, a very actually broad, uh, broad retinal image. So you can you can you can know okay, dry eye is actually uh, dry eye has actually uh, decreased retinal image. So you know, wavefront sensors can evaluate abrasion of the whole eye quantitatively. Now, uh, let me share with you a uh, tear film breakup pattern. Actually, this is very actually simple technique. Uh, no machine, just with fluorescent. You know, you fluorescent, you have everywhere, and everybody have a fluorescent paper as your slit lamp. Very simple technique. No, actually, no updated one, but very simple, but I, I, like, very, by, I like very much. I, I believe uh, all the corneal specialists like fluorescent technique. Okay, so recently, uh, Professor Yoko in Japan uh, proposed uh, five different tear film breakup pattern. Actually, he actually increased one more type, but, but right now, actually, I just actually uh, explained five different pattern. So this is, the, the we call area break. So upward movement of the fluorescent is not observed or limitedly actually observed within the lower part of the cornea. Right after the bring, you already actually, you can observe the actually uh, tear film breakup for the cornea. This is actually associated with the severe type of aqueous tear deficient dry eye. This is the uh, line break. Line break is associated with the mild or moderate uh, type aqueous tear deficient dry eye. You can see the uh, kind of light linear break in the lower part of the cornea with the flor upward, uh, fluorescent upward movement. So this is the spot break pattern. You can see the uh, round break uh, right after the blink. It is associated with the severe uh, dry eye with decreased, uh, well, decreased wettability of the ocular surface. So this is we call a uh, gimple break. Actually, an irregular but vertical line, linear-like shape during the upward movement of the fluorescent within the central part of the cornea can be observed. You can see the breakup. So this is actually associated with uh, mild or moderate actually uh, dry eye with 
uh, decreased wettability of the ocular surface. So the last one is uh, uh, we call random break. Random break is actually associated with uh, evaporative dryer. An irregular and ident uh, uh, an irregular shape occurs after the cessation of upward movement of fluorescent. So after the uh, fluorescent movement, actually you can observe the tear film breakup. So this is uh, actually the summary of these uh, tear film breakup patterns. So based on if you actually observe the tear film breakup pattern, just using the fluorescent technique, fluorescent paper, you can actually classify dry eye into three patterns, ecclesia deficient dry eye, dry eye with decreased wettability, and evaporative dry eye. Ecclesia deficient dry eye is actually insufficient component is actually aqueous tear, aqueous tears. In dry eye with decreased wettability, insufficient component of the ocular surface is membrane associated mucin. And in evaporative dry eye, insufficient component of the ocular surface is actually uh, support, uh, so thought to be lipid or secretory mucin. And again, area break is actually associated with severe type of aqueous tear deficient dry eye, and line break is actually associated with uh, mild or moderate aqueous tear deficient dry eye. And spot break, spot break is associated with uh, severe type of dry eye with decreased wettability. Very, very actually uh, kind of uh, characteristic. And dimple break is associated with mild to moderate dry eye with decreased wettability. And random break is actually even in normal eye, we can observe such kind of pattern. This is actually associated with evaporative dry eye, such as actually dry eye uh, uh, comes with MGD. Now, uh, because I like uh, optical quality, so I, I actually uh, thought actually uh, so I actually investigated actually relationship between the tear film break pattern and quality vision. Again, severe type of acus tear deficient dry eye because in such cases, many cases, many severe cases, they have a lot of uh, corneal epithelial damage, like including the central part of the cornea. So in that case, right after the blink, the, you, you, can, you can see the increase of higher duration. But because in such cases, the tear film is very, very, uh, the tear film uh, thickness is very thin, and there is no tears, so acus tear is insufficient. So you cannot see the kind of changes in higher duration. So actually, blurred retinal image is actually almost during the continuous during for the 10 seconds. But for the, if you look at the line break, uh, line break, mild, moderate, actually, uh, a deficient dry eye, in such cases, especially if you don't see the uh, corneal epithelial damage in the central part of the cornea, it looks like normal at the beginning, and but the beginning. but. But also, this is uh, because this is acus tear deficiency, uh, there is no tear, so there is no change. So it looks like if there is no uh, SPK in the central part of the cornea, there is no increase of higher duration. And for the uh, spot break, severe type of uh, dry eye with decreased wettability, actually, this tear break up, the up, tear break up is too fast to de be detected. So far, uh, current actually a uh, commercially available way for the machine cannot detect the uh, optical quality. But for the uh, dimple break, uh, mild to moderate uh, dry eye with decreased wettability. Uh, so right after the bring, actually the tear film is covered, uh, o corneal surface is covered by tear film, and you can see the nice images at the beginning. But after, uh, with time, tear film actually, uh, tear film stability actually decreases. So the higher duration increases after the blink. It, uh, it can explain a fluctuating vision with the blink. For the uh, evaporative dry, it depends on the uh, length of the BUT. So if the BUT is longer than 10 seconds, actually you can, uh, you can, you can expect actually kind of stable pattern. But if the BUT is less than 10 seconds, uh, it may be actually, uh, we may actually uh, observe such kind of increasing pattern of higher duration. Uh, as you know, as recently uh, asked for us actually proposed an algorithm for the operative diagnosis and treatment of ocular surface disorders. According to, according to this paper, 
actually dry eye may compromise the results of corneal cataract and refractive surgery. So as I mentioned today, dry eye can adversely affect refractive measurements before surgery. So we must actually uh, check the dry eye and ocular surface before surgery very carefully. This is my uh, last, present, uh, last sub slide. So quantifying optical quality with corneal topographic or wavefront analysis can objectively uh, demonstrate that both tear film stability and ocular surface damage degrade quality vision in dry eye. Thank you for your attention. Are there uh, any questions for Dr. Ko? So Shizuka, how do you um, manage patients prior to cataract surgery? Do you, do you routinely look at their ocular surface? Do you obtain their measurements first? What, what's your workflow for okay. evaluating these patients? Uh, actually, uh, actually in Japan, unlike the United States, we don't uh, have uh, actually inflammation kit or something like this. But so we basically actually, we of, of course, we check the uh, ocular surface with fluorescent and we measure the tear film breakup time. And also, as I shown today, we also ob uh, observe the tear film breakup pattern because if we actually identify dry eye before the surgery, we have to actually manage dry eye first. And also, based on the uh, pattern, we actually may actually, we actually give the patient uh, the optimal treatment. Thank you. That is a very interesting talk. So based on your findings, d mm -hmm. what drops do you choose for the evaporative dry eye, for the mucin induction dry eye? You mean the uh, treatment? Or yes, yes. Ah, yes. treatment. Okay. I think uh, I probably it, it actually depends on the actually uh, country because some, some eye drops are available or some, some, some not available. But in Japan, uh, so, so, so you mean the evaporative or all that kind of dry eye? Or? No. Three groups, okay, three groups. Okay, a bit, uh, so ecosphere deficient dry eye because this type is actually insufficient uh, uh, component is aqua. So we need, uh, we actually, supplementation will actually, uh, what aqua is needed. So if, so if, especially for the severe case, I recommend a punctal plug because it, in case, such cases actually, it is very difficult to actually just to treat with the artificial tear, uh, but for the mild to moderate uh, type of dry eye, actually uh, in Japan we have uh, uh, dequaphosal uh, eye drops, after which can um, secrete mucin and uh, aqueous, te aqueous tear. Uh, but, but here I know uh, some actually mild cases of aqueous tear deficient dry eye, uh, hyalurate actually nat sodium natrium is also available. I think it can work. But for the uh, dry eye with uh, decreased wettability, I think we, this, this type of dry eye is need uh, mucin. So mucin, uh, mucin actually stimulation, uh, stimulation, the, the eye drop which can st stimulate mucin is actually needed for such kind of uh, patient. For evaporative dry eye, it depends on the uh, insufficient component. Some people actually uh, need some repeat or some people need uh, echoes here and some people need uh, mucin. And b based on the, uh, based I think we can actually supply uh, individual cases. Yes. Maybe we can discuss later. <laughs> Any other questions? Otherwise. Sorry, sorry to ask you again. Specifically for mucin deficiency dry eye, which we can find out by the blink pattern, which mm -hmm. particular dry which particular drop do you prescribe when you feel the patient has got mucin so deficiency? You so you mean the treatment? Treatment. treatment. Uh, right now in Japan we have uh, commercial available drops uh, to uh, to, to uh, secrete mucin is rebamipide, but I, kn I know <laughs> India has a, uh, in India there are some domestic uh, rebamipide, but I'm not sure. I, I, I have no e experience of using uh, uh, drops here, but in Japan we actually use rebamipide and also jiquafosol. Jiquafosol is uh, 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 it can actually secrete mucin and water, so both rebamipide um, and jiquafosol. Great. Thank you. Okay, our final speaker is uh, Tushara Gawal, who's going to talk about decision making with anterior segment OCT.
in the meantime, just uh, yeah. um, clarification, you said that two drops you know, for the mucin deficiency. One is aflibus, you are able to hear it clearly. The second uh, drops you said no? for the treatment of the mucin deficiency. Jika? How do you spell Jika Fusati? need images for imaging talk. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. So. Seven microscopes in your OT integrate the anti swing OCT and in the aims. Okay, I will text you. You are in the Mewatsu group. I am from Arivo, Chennai. Konya uh, Chief Unia, Unit Chief Konya. So we have, uh, like I said, we had the earlier generation one. The first generation uh, intraopacity microscope, if you see, they are very good for cornea, but they will not focus that well on the, on the lens. And the second generation which has come is very good for the lens, but doesn't focus that well for the cornea. So if you do the corneal procedures, uh, people are you know, always wanting the first generation one. And when you are doing cataractus procedure, for instance, if you are doing a posterior polar cataract, then again, you can actually pick up uh, a pre-existing defect or a pre-existing rent just before you start your case. And when you are doing, you know, layer by layer, uh, uh, layer by layer, you are doing phaco emulsification, then as those layers are taken away and less amount of the nuclear material remains, then you can actually pick up whether there is a PC defect or not or whether it is communicating to the, uh, you know, vitreous or sometimes when you do the uh, uh, nuclear emulsification, if the vitreous is actually herniating out. So those are the kind of things that
it shows what all can be done with these. So the first patient has a superficial involvement. You can do a PTK or a SALC or superficial uh, lamellar keratoplasty. The, the bottom right and the bottom left cases, they have both anterior and posterior involvement and can undergo a DALC. And the last case has a very severe involvement extending right up to the endothelium and a penetrating keratoplasty would be a better option for such a patient. These are two different cases of Salzman nodular degeneration. The first case, the involvement is superficial. So the patient can under, undergo either a PTK or a SALC. And the, on, on the right side, uh, the, it shows a much deeper involvement. So the patient will need a, a deep LK or an ALTK with a deeper head. Uh, these, are, these are a few other cases where we plan uh, various lamellar anterior lamellar procedures uh, based on the ASOCT. This patient underwent an ALTK. Now, uh, this, uh, this also helps in monitoring of these cases. As you can see that uh, the, the uh, recurrence was seen in this case, but you can see that it is limited to the graft and following the, the, the graft, the patient became okay. This is a case of uh, gelatinous drop-like dystrophy which recurred very badly in, a, in an LK, but, but the OCT showed that uh, uh, the, the recurrence was limited to the graft and the un underlying corneum was clear and it uh, cleared dramatically following uh, surgery. Uh, DMD is a classical indication where OCT helps you. Uh, where it not only uh, tells you that there is a DMD, but it, uh, you, if you do the OCT in all quadrants, it can tell you in which, from which area to uh, go inside the eye and uh, inject the air or the gas. And lastly, if you have a foreign body, uh, especially if it looks deep, you can actually do an OCT to check whether the foreign body uh, can be removed uh, from the anterior root. Uh, to summarize this part, it gives you the exact localization of the lesions in the cornea. Especially for the anterior lamellar surgeries, it helps you to plan which type of surgery to be done. And it makes the customized component surgery of the cornea possible. And in some cases like DMD, it actually guides you how to do the surgery. And this is the last part. Uh, so com in comparison to the anterior lamellar keratoplasty where pre-op OCT is important, the endothelial keratoplasty is actually the post-operative uh, uh, OCTs are more important. This is how uh, it typically goes from, uh, from top right and then bottom, that the graft usually thins over a time, and this is how you monitor. So it's important to monitor, uh, to, to scan all areas. In this uh, case of uh, uh, ultrathon DSEC, which has been done, you can see that one area is attached, but the, the other side of the graft was detached, and it might need uh, an air injection. You can also delineate the exact uh, uh, the cause of the graft detachment here, you can see that there is a scrolled uh, host uh, Desmet's membrane which is actually impeding the graft edge and unless this membrane is removed, the graft is not probably going to attach itself. There are a few other examples where you can actually delineate the cause of the graft detachment. This is a case where there was retained viscoelastic after a DSEC triple and this is a case where there is a complete retained Desmet's membrane in, in the interface causing a graft detachment. And uh, this is a, an example of uh, uh, rebubbling after a DSEC detachment. You can also pick up uh, DSEC rejections where you can uh, pick up either thickening of the graft or uh, hyperreflective shadows which were not previously present uh, on the endothelial side. Uh, this is a case of ICE syndrome which had an ultra thin DSEC. The graft did well for a period of time. It failed and underwent a DMEC later on. And uh, in DMEC, it is absolutely imperative to do uh, uh, post-operative OCTs in all patients because it's difficult to catch uh, especially small pockets of fluid in, in DMEC. This is a case where the edge, one edge is lifted and all these, uh, the, the in, uh, compared to DSEX, DMEX actually need more aggressive forms of intervention. And this is a case where the entire graft is, uh, DMEC graft is detached and uh, uh, it needs rebubbling. Now to summarize, ASOCT is useful in reaffirming our clinical diagnosis in most conditions. Uh, if the corneas are hazy or the presentations are atypical, then it helps in uh, arriving at a diagnosis. Uh, in, in anterior lamellar keratoplasties, preoperative ASOCTs help in determining which surgery is to be done. And in endothelial keratoplasty, it is uh, the postoperative OCTs which uh, help us uh, in managing the patients postoperatively. Thank you. I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Sridevi, my senior resident, who helped me compile the, the, all the images, and Dr. Namrata for sharing a lot many of her images. Thank you. Thank you, Tushar. I think.
This, uh, this session is r running over, so I'm not sure that we have time for questions, but please grab Dr. Tushar here if you do have questions. I want to thank everyone for sticking with us through the AV problems uh, for a great session. Thank you. Thank you.